Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And today is an episode about a topic we get asked about a lot, uh, PMDD, or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So we thought we would hook everyone in by talking about the treatments, get straight to the point, and specifically what the differences are in the treatment for PMDD and for sex offenders. So what do we have on the chart? Yeah, so uh, as you can see, there is some uh, evidence-based approaches for treating both of these conditions. We certainly use SSRIs for both. Um, we certainly use GNRH analogs for both um, at very high doses. Uh, chemical castration is what we call it for sex offenders. Um, we also use antiandrogens for both. And we also physically remove sex organs for both. And I would actually add something, we use antipsychotics, um, dopamine antagonist for both as well. That's true. There is a, a trial looking at Seroquel, I believe, specifically, quetiapine uh, mm -hmm. being the generic there. So some pretty striking contrast, or actually lack of contrast, between two <laughs> very different cases. Yeah. Um, and yeah. when you say we, we're talking about the uh, your run-of-the-mill traditional um, it, I assume it's the psychiatrist prescribing the SSRIs and antipsychotics, yeah. and then your ob or general surgeons that are doing the removal of the, the uterus and ovaries and so forth. Yeah, hopefully it's that way and not the <laughs> other way around. And we are not <laughs> trying to make light of either one of these uh, conditions whatsoever. We just thought that that would uh, stimulate the algorithm with lots of comments on how we treat these conditions, or perhaps not how we treat these conditions, but how the conventional medicine system, medicine system treats them. Um, PMDD is an example of a pathology that is just ripe for treatment with root cause medicine, true functional medicine, not dysfunctional medicine, as we call it. And I guess that's a good segue into um, a non-systematic review that we like to do of the evidence. And uh, you'll get a good idea of how we treat this condition, which is... Um, surprise, surprise, via individualized medicine and shared decision-making? Absolutely. One question just before we get into the symptoms and how this is diagnosed. Is PMDD a psychiatric condition or a women's health condition? <laughs> uh, that, that's a tough one. I suppose you could ask the same thing about um, a lot of different conditions. Um, I guess if uh, I'm answering the question Seriously, then I see PMDD mostly as a hormonal pathology, just like menopause. Um, I believe they used to call it hysteria, his, hist for uterus, like a hysterectomy. Um, that's the root word for uterus and hysteria for um, being crazy around the time of your period. So this is not a new thing. Um, it's been treated differently um, by different cultures and different religions um, uh, with varying success, but Probably not a lot of addressing the root cause. Unfortunately, we can address the root cause, but our medical system just does not like to do that. Yeah, I, I probably would have just answered the question as yes. I kind of see it as a, a Venn diagram. And when people want to put you in an either or, uh, I like to push back against that. It's very frustrating for them. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, we go to the, the daily symptom chart and you have uh, anxiety, irritability, depression, uh, nervous tension, mood swings, feeling out of control, um, poor coordination, insomnia, confusion, headache, crying, fatigue, aches, breast tenderness, cramps, swelling, um, and I'm sure bloating could be in that same category, and then food cravings. So you have a, a spectrum of mental effects and then also physical effects that people objectively can see. like. You know, if your scale goes up three pounds or five pounds, you know, that's not in your head. This isn't something that is psychiatric, but the secondary symptoms related to that hormone change we alluded to uh, definitely can produce some psychiatric symptoms. So how do we go about diagnosing someone with this? I mean, it seems like 70 or 80% of the population has some combination of those symptoms. Yeah, so for PMDD specifically, you want to have at least five of these and you want to have them just before your menstrual period. Um, in general, the, the one week before your period and then within a day or two or three, you want all, um, all of those symptoms to significantly improve or completely resolve. So the timing of the symptoms 
is what matters in this case. Yeah, and then I think also the severity of the symptoms is what sort of delineates, you know, there's PMS and then PMDD, which technically are two separate entities, but it's kind of like a spectrum of how severe the symptoms are. Um, and then an important thing is, you know, is this causing distress in someone's life? So someone can say, oh yeah, I, I know that my sleep gets a little bit worse. I feel a little bit anxious, but does it affect me at all? No, I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. Then it's not, you know, pathologic at that point. Um, same thing with someone's level of libido. Yep. Someone may have a low libido and they don't find it to be problematic. It doesn't affect them negatively. Uh, then it's not a pathology. You don't necessarily need to treat that. Uh, and then the final portion is, of course, making it a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, it's not related to you know, drug use or another condition, a thyroid condition or POI or bipolar, which also has some cyclical component to it mm -hmm. that could be with a very sloppy history misdiagnosed. What about low testosterone in a female? Is that part of the diagnosis of exclusion? Low testosterone in a female? Yeah. Well, what if what if you're on <laughs> what if you're on um, you know something already that's decreasing your testosterone, like an oral contraceptive pill? Well, it's convenient then that oral contraceptives are already the treatment for PMDD. Oh, how convenient! What if you're on a um, what if you have endometriosis and you're on Orlissa? Well, then you're already chemically castrated. Very convenient. Hmm. That's that's interesting. It kind of reminds me of. IBS with irritable bowel syndrome, I remember looking at this huge chart with evidence-based treatments and you have things that are procholinergic, anticholinergic, serotonergic, anti-serotonergic, dopaminergic, anti-dopaminergic. And you're just thinking, mm -hmm. all right, this is not, this is just like, this is just throwing things at a diagnosis of exclusion and seeing what works. Yeah. And that's about what you see with IBS. I mean, even, you know, acupuncture has some degree of effectiveness. There's a, I would say there's also a strong placebo response in yep. someone with IBS. So you, you switch up a diet, the person gets better. You think that, oh, then that must have been the food that was causing the problem. Because uh, there is some overlap between, you know, these, this expectation of GI symptoms, you kind of get into this groove or this cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but to not to delve too far, uh, we looked at a chart and just modified it slightly um, to be more accurate of the normal menstrual cycle. So day one through day 28, I think it's very important to note that day one is the first day of menses, the first day of bleeding. Uh, it's important to clarify that with your patients or with your provider, because I, I would say most women know this when they're tracking their cycle, but mm. there are a fair number of women who think that the day they stop bleeding is day one. Um, and that can make your interpretation of the blood work quite confusing. Um, so very important to make sure yourself and the patient are on the, the same page. Um, mm -hmm. So what do we think about this chart here? Um, for reference, what we added was the testosterone level, which is suspiciously missing from most female hormone charts. Yeah. Um, and then what I like to call the progesterone roller coaster. Yeah, I think those are great ways to look at it. I like that we corrected for the units. So if you're looking at the comparison of testosterone and estradiol, given that testosterone directly converts to estradiol via aromatase enzyme, it makes sense to look at both of them in nanograms per deciliter or both of them in picograms per milliliter. Um, a lot of times progesterone is in, picogra uh, is in nanograms per milliliter, you know, that's usually not used, but that, uh, that's like slightly non-contributory because testosterone and estrad estradiol do not directly convert um, between uh, progesterone and not. And we don't need to talk about cortisol steel or these other concepts, which really aren't too clinically significant. What is clinically significant is a lot of these treatments will suppress the production of testosterone or the amount of free testosterone that is actively binding throughout the body. The average circulating ratio, as I know we've mentioned many times over the last several years, is that uh, most women have about three times as much testosterone as estradiol circulating at any one time. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, if you look at the amount of testosterone that aromatizes, a lot of that has to do with body fat, alcohol consumption, which we'll touch base on later. Yeah, it, just going into a little bit more detail in a non-scientific way here at the progesterone roller coaster, you have some people 
that when they're going up the roller coaster, this increase in progesterone is going to cause some dysphoria. Some people get scared before the first drop. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the problem here is that once that progesterone starts to drop, that there's actually no track left. Yeah. So at that point, you can imagine that's not going to be a very pleasant experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fortunately, not every woman uh, runs out of track, as it says here, as it would suggest here, whenever you're going down the progesterone roller coaster. Um, and some women are not affected by it, but it seems like it's a probably not the majority, but I've seen figures around 40% or so that have some degree of increase in insomnia or anxiety or depression. Those things tend to spike in this luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. And we'll get a bit more into mechanism later. As people know, we, we're fans of mechanism of action. And progesterone itself is likely not one of the major contributors to this. It's rather the metabolites of progesterone or um, other progestogens. So progestogens are just any sort of um, progesterone. So you have pregnenolone, you have progesterone, you have dihydroprogesterone, you have tetrahydroprogesterone or allopregnanolone, and also isoallopregnanolone, um, another metabolite of progesterone. And in a non-pathologic state, what likely happens is progesterone cascades down into these other progestogens. Some of them activate the GABA-A receptor, decreasing anxiety. Um, some of them inactivate it, decreasing um, symptoms of depression. Um, things that bind the GABA-A receptor strongly are depressants. You think of alcohol, you think of benzodiazepines. So there's a balance and the um, conversion of progestogens to its metabolites in a non-pathologic state helps equate the balance with equal conversion to its various metabolites. Yeah, it seems to center around GABA and GABA-A stability, uh, not having big fluctuations or swings that cause this sort of um, rebound anxiety. Um, that's why lifestyle is very important mm -hmm. around you know the menstrual cycle and, and for those, especially with PMDD, uh, it's very common to note that you know alcohol can definitely make a small problem worse than it is. I, I can't say that I've recommended alcohol to improve any health problems, actually, thinking about it. Yeah, I haven't, I have not thought of one yet. All right. So looking at the International Association for Premenstrual Disorders, um, this actually seems to be a pretty well put together organization. They basically listed out a bulk, not every single study, but a majority of the studies and common methods that are used and then gave their own sort of rating on the efficacy, um, the side effects, um, how it works, and even included some of the sort of non-conventional treatments in their chart mm -hmm. here, like the digitasteride, which you know, we kind of called an anti-androgen earlier, because I guess the net effect is less androgenic signaling, so that's, that's kind of fair. Um, but this summary, when I was looking at this, I, I thought to myself, thinking back to our episode on hypothalamic amenorrhea, that this really kind of puts to shame the guidelines we saw from the endocrine society. You know, yeah, they were quite it does. paltry by comparison with very few studies referenced and a lot of things that were, that had came out even prior to that publication were not mentioned in that paper. Yeah. Um, and as you would expect, most med students know if there is a condition that's a mental health condition, or whether it's dysphoria or depression, um, or anxiety, an SSRI is almost always the right answer. It might not be the root cause answer, but um, interestingly enough, and credit to our colleague Dan Bristow, um, Dr. Dan Bristow, for uh, some of this info, SSRIs have effects other than increasing serotonin at the synapse. So they're obviously selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. In the past, I believe in episodes on ADHD, and OCD, we've talked about how they can also antagonize or upregulate sigma-1 activity, um, which has to do with parasympathetic tone, but they also alter the conversion of progestogenic metabolites. Yeah, and it, it's not a one-way arrow in the way that they convert those. Um, it sort of takes that, you know, the pathologic state you were talking about earlier where there's not that perfect balance at GABA-A it takes that and normalizes this uh, 3 alpha HSD enzyme. Um, so some of the studies that have been done with this showed that individuals with really high levels of allopregnenolone 
return to the median. Individuals with lower baseline levels of this alloprofanolone uh, also return to the median, have an increase. Uh, and I believe that was with sertraline. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems that they all have some efficacy in this. Um, you know, fluoxetine has been studied pretty extensively. If I'm picking one of these, it's probably not going to be fluoxetine just because of the host of drug-drug interactions that are possible there. Probably going to pick something newer with um, slightly less interaction with other medications. Yeah, I think that's a good summary of SSRIs. Uh, that being said, even though they're first on the list, it does not necessarily mean that they should be first on the list of treatment. Um, a lot of SSRIs do have a withdrawal syndrome that can last about a week. It depends on which SSRI it is. For example, a SNRI like Effexor would probably be a terrible choice, especially if you're going to use it cyclically because you'd have a terrible withdrawal each time you came off of it. Some people do take these throughout the month, but if they're only have if they're taking something every day for a disorder that they only have a week's worth of symptoms for doesn't make as much sense. If someone's on no medications, then maybe um, fluoxetine or generic Prozac makes more sense because it has slightly less withdrawal because it has a lot of active metabolites. In the case if they're on no other medications or supplements or almost none, um, but it's certainly uh, an individualized choice, much like a choice of an oral contraceptive for someone who wants an oral contraceptive. It's not a grab bag and you just pick a random SSRI and pick a random oral contraceptive because they're all the same. Yeah, and you wouldn't necessarily do both of these things, um, but it is a kind of interesting take when you look at the, the mechanism by which the SSRI is improving things here. A patient would say, oh, I don't wanna go on an SSRI. I wanna treat the root cause. It's like, oh, so would you like to you know, stabilize your allopregnanolone signaling and take your high level of allopregnanolone to baseline? Yes. It's like, okay, well, an SSRI does that. It doesn't mean it's the only way to get that effect, um, but it's interesting that it does have some action that's very close to a root cause there, even though that's not the primary you know, mechanism we think of with SSRIs. Yeah. I guess one last note on SSRIs is Later, we'll note the various interactions between the progestogens and the androgens. For example, 5-alpha reductase enzyme um, has actions on androgens as well, converting testosterone to DHT. So SSRIs potentially have um, an interesting interaction with the androgenic pool as well. Yeah, it's an exciting tease to our all things neurosteroid episode that we'll sit down and record. It'll be very granular, uh, exciting for us, maybe less exciting for the listeners, but I'm excited to look at that. Yeah. So next we have oral contraceptives, which can be a reasonable choice if someone desires contraception and also desires this stability or, or resolving or lessening the premenstrual dysphoric symptoms. Um, not always a bad option. Uh, they do recommend a drosperinone containing oral contraceptive, which seems to prevent a lower or present a lower risk of VTE, blood clots, risks in general, but is associated with a slight uptick in depression, um, yeah, probably due to its anti-androgenic effects that yep. you see. Um, you know, we have this chart that we've published, or not we published, but that has been published and we used in our previous discussion about synthetic hormones, synthetic estrogens, and progestin specifically. Yeah, it's a, it can be a good choice for those with PCOS or that those have, that have androgen dominance, but um, certainly not a great choice for everyone. Probably not a great choice for someone with a very high SHBG. And at the end of the day, at, again, see our oral contraceptive podcast for more info on this. This is just synthetic hormone replacement. Yeah. So, so these two here, these are considered first and second line treatment. Why would you use synthetic hormone replacement when you can just use bioidentical hormone replacement? Well, we'll get to that, the answer to that question, at least the international um, society's answer to that question at the end of this chart. Um, but let's look at some more treatments with strong scientific evidence for efficacy and safety. Um, when you think of something that is very safe, do GNRH analogs come to mind as a safe medication? Like Lupron? That, yeah, that we give basically like we give sex offenders. Yeah, basically like popping a Tylenol, right? Pretty Doesn't, safe. Just don't take too much. Every yeah. once in a while is okay. If you're okay with being infertile or having low testosterone, I would consider it safe. Or having osteoporosis or having coronary artery disease. 
Yeah, and here's where the you sort of have these two branches where the treatment is a bit different between uh, women with PMDD and sex offenders. So the sex offender will just get the GnRH analog alone. Um, there is a subset of women who will get the Lupron, the GnRH ag, uh, analog, and then also stable hormone ADVAC. So this would be equivalent of, we, we talked about this a bit earlier, taking that sex offender, you chemically castrate them, and then you give them what maybe, you know, a quarter or, you know, a third of what their previous hormone level was. Yeah. And uh, we actually looked into this a bit. We tried to see if the treatment is the same for female sex offenders, or if they do give them a touch of estrogen and progesterone after um, the GnRH agonist. And we couldn't find it. Um, several studies mention the treatment of female sex offenders, but they don't mention if they treated them differently. So that would be interesting to see. It would also be interesting to see if male sex offenders were also given a touch of estradiol for cardio protection. Yeah, I specifically know from you know some of my previous work in uh, nursing in different settings that they will use estradiol in some cases to um, suppress problematic sexual behaviors in uh, elderly male patients in a, like a nursing home, long-term mm -hmm. care setting. Uh, and these are people who are typically, you know, either teetering on or have a full-blown dementia um, or they have this problem with impulse control and it will um, you know, trigger that feedback loop and suppress their you know, gonadotropin production lower testosterone, and then in the majority of cases, it will lower that impulse, uh, specifically sexually. All right, and then again, I'm kind of surprised that this same heading is used for an even more aggressive treatment. It yeah. is uh, strong scientific <laughs> evidence um, for efficacy and safety. And what do we have here? Um, these are, it, it's interesting that these are both on the same slide, actually. We have total hysterectomy with bi bilateral salpingo ophorectomy, and then we have CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, so uh, efficacy and safety. Another way to say that would be safe and effective. Cognitive behavioral therapy, yes. Um, removing your uterus, fallopian tubes, and both ovaries. Effective, I suppose you could make a case that it's effective, but uh, I would not consider this safe. Even if it's a routine total hist, uh, a hysterectomy, total hysterectomy, um, it, sometimes it's necessary, but uh, this I, don't, would be, I don't think... Uh, this would be entirely elective. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just a routine. The, the authors of this say it's a very routine and safe gynecologic procedure. Yeah. I, I mean... Routine for a gynecologist that does these routinely, routine for the average woman in the population, definitely not. Yeah. Um, th this recommendation is a bit off. Uh, this would really be considered a last resort. I suppose if you had multiple other indications, um, severe menorrhagia, um, where you can't control it otherwise, and you also happen to have PMDD, then really it would just be a secondary benefit that you would get. But in general, I would recommend this being an absolute last resort and probably less than 0.01% of people would need it specifically for PMDD. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and then scrolling down to, this is an interesting heading here. They have treatments with limited but promising scientific evidence for efficacy and safety in PMDD. Uh, and we'll circle back to some of these studies and make some comments after we go through them in entirety, talk about some of the specifics that we thought were interesting or concerning. Um, but we have 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So finasteride specifically has not been studied in this regard. Um, Dutasteride has been studied in this regard. And they used 2.5 milligrams per day and when they used that dose, they were able to inhibit the conversion of progesterone to um, dihydroprogesterone. And then downstream, you're missing out on allopregnanolone. So we go back to this concept of allopregnanolone or, or GABA-A stability. And if you have you know, a stable level of allopregnanolone, good. If you have a high level and it stays there, good. If you have a low level or a you know, essentially undetectable level, 
uh, then you also don't have fluctuation and you will improve symptoms. Yeah, this is kind of interesting because 2.5 mg per day is a very high dose. And I believe another study showed that 0.5 mg per day did not have efficacy. And we do know that looking at, um, not from a uh, large clinical study, but inferring from preclinical studies, um, dutasteride likely leads to uh, less suppression of um, progesterone converting to DHP uh, and allopragnanolone, it's neurosteroid derivatives, than finasteride. So you'd think that finasteride would have more efficacy at a lower dose, but uh, and also uh, a much shorter half-life. So if you're going to give a female that desires um, fertility soon in the future, then finasteride on paper would look like a better option. But in practice, females tend to tolerate dutasteride much better than finasteride. We've done um, several episodes on finasteride syndromes or um, you know, different effects of dutasteride, finasteride, the three different isoenzymes of 5-alpha reductase. 5-alpha reductase is actually three enzymes, um, one, two, and three. Um, and we don't need to get into too much detail or spe specificity here. Um, but the, the main limitation of this would be the dose of dutasteride in a female that desires fertility at, uh, that's relatively soon. A lot of times dutasteride is given at very low doses. And perhaps if they design the study differently, they could look at something like a single dose or two days but likely just a single dose of 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride around day 21 of the cycle. And that may have just enough, just as much efficacy because it, um, it gets to that threshold where it's high enough and um, it is metabolized slow enough at that high of a dose, again, dose dependent half-life to where it might still have efficacy. Yeah, that'd be an interesting one. What I'm thinking of when I see this is, you know, presumably, let's say you have a woman who's taking this uninterrupted. Um, we know that men who are taking, and, and older men granted, taking half a milligram of dutasteride per day, you know, they miss a month and basically their DHT levels are unchanged. They start to trickle up a little bit, but mm -hmm. it can take several months for that dutasteride or the effect of the dutasteride to be out of your system at 20% of this dose. So you know, these would be younger women. So in theory, they would metabolize a little bit quicker, but it's still a hefty dose. And you would definitely want to uh, look at, you know, reproductive counseling, like all of these treatments, right? You wouldn't yep. take out somebody's, you know, uterus without doing some reproductive counseling. I hope I yeah. um, wouldn't put someone on a GNRH analog without some reproductive counseling. Unless they have endometriosis. Yes. Then that does happen. Then it's unfortunately fine. too often. Yep. Uh, we've seen it many times personally as well. Um, not to get off onto too much of a rabbit trail. Um, we'll, we'll dive deep into 5-alpha reductase inhibitors again in the future. There's a lot of misinformation around there. There's no such thing as a dutasteride syndrome if you have normal testosterone. Um, and uh, women and men both, as we've mentioned, have different androgen receptor sensitivities that we know of. There is no DHT receptor. There is no allotestosterone receptor, also known as androstenediol. We'll talk about that more later too. Um, lots of teasers today, but uh, that should sum up uh, dutasteride as a treatment. And next we can um, talk about what we mentioned earlier. Why not just use bioidentical HRT instead of oral contraceptives? Well, this is actually synthetic HRT again. Uh, disappointing. We'll get to the bioidenticals eventually. We had to actually dig in and find those studies on our own because they, they didn't make it into the guidelines. But Yeah, you shouldn't put a guideline on a bioidentical hormone. It might actually work. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it too simple. So they used a technique, ovulation suppression, using a synthetic progestogen um, cyclically and then with transdermal estradiol because um, you do, at least you're giving some hormone add back there. You know, perhaps not enough. Even with the GnRH agonist and hormone add back, uh, they don't add back testosterone, uh, which is the most abundant hormone. You know, like we pointed out and like we outlined on our chart. Um, but anyway, that's a, a bit of an aside. By the way, when you don't add back testosterone and you add estrogen and progestogen, whether it's bioidentical or synthetic, you suppress endogenous testosterone. So that might be therapeutic in someone with really significant androgen dominance 
or it might be causing side effects in someone with a baseline low level of androgen. Absolutely. So they did this small study. Um, there's downsides of you know increased risk of blood clots with these synthetic progestogens. I don't know that this would be superior at all to you know basically like they pointed out a contraceptive that contains drosperinone. Mm -hmm. But the study was done, and you know, props to them for putting it in their chart with you know, I guess about a dozen different options and studies that have been done. Yeah. Uh, and then we have quetiapine, um, which it said would be used as an adjunct to SSRI. Uh, and this is where, again, this is a very small dose of it, but giving someone twenty milligram, twenty five milligrams of quetiapine is probably going to make them, um, what, too tired to feel stressed out. Yeah, I guess so. Presumably this is given in the evening, like amitriptyline is off-label often to help them sleep better. I suppose if most of the symptoms are during sleep, then it could help, but it doesn't seem like a, it's certainly not a, a great go-to option or a very good root cause option, assuming that you've done your diagnosis of, diagnosis of exclusion correctly. Yeah, I, I suppose if you give someone an antipsychotic and it's a dysthymia that you've misdiagnosed, then Congratulations, you have successfully treated the patient. It's like the math problem meme where mm -hmm. the teacher says you did all the work wrong, but you got the right answer. Yeah. And then I suppose you could make a case that if someone's been taking even this low dose of uh, catiapine, do we know if they took it for just one week or if they took it um, all month? Yeah, we during don't know. During the I would luteal phase? Perhaps just during the luteal phase. So if it's just the last seven days or last 14 days of the menstrual cycle, then that's more reasonable um, because they're less likely to gain a bunch of weight and then aromatize even more and have even more estrogen dominance and then have uh, more menstrual irregularities. But I suppose you could cover that up if you gave them Seroquel and an oral contraceptive pill. That would be your ultimate don't treat the pathology, cover up the symptoms and deal with it later stack. An oral contraceptive <laughs> and Seroquel for the last seven days. To 10 days. It's a pretty, exact, a pretty effective cover up. Um, and then we have um, this is probably the like this line right here that we have, this row is probably what I would consider the closest to the root cause um, as far as a treatment that we have, you know, potentially downstream. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this one is only available as an injection still, um, mm -hmm. just like, you know, Bruxanolone, which um, would probably work also, but yes. basically this is isoalopregnanolone, as you alluded to earlier. This is also a metabolite of progesterone, mm -hmm. just as allopregnanolone is. So I would speculate that you would give, you know, the allopregnanolone that's available by IV for a low price of what, around $20,000 for 14 days, something like that. Yep. Um, you'll Good probably, and accessible to all regardless of yeah. insurance. You probably are going to get the same effect there, stabilizing the uh, GABA-A signaling during this time period. Um, hopefully they get some sort of an oral form of this because you know, mm -hmm. this is like, a, I think a 2017 trial uh, yeah. that, that Dr. Bristow pointed out. I think it was a 2017 paper where we know this works, um, but we don't have anything that, as far as I'm aware, is like in phase three or soon to come out. I think it's still yeah. in the development phase. I believe the same company owns the rights to this, which is the, um, the GABA-A antagonist, isoallopregnanolone. Um, Brexanolone, as you mentioned, is um, allopregnanolone. Um, and by the way, the way that I think of these two is similar to T3 and reverse T3. So T4 is your main thyroid hormone, and then it converts to T3, your active thyroid, and reverse T3, your inactive thyroid hormone. And they, they balance each other out, almost like a tug of rope. Um, and the same thing is the case for isoallopregnanolone and allopregnanolone. They also balance each other out. And when that doesn't happen, then I suppose you could say you get PMS or PMDD. It would be very interesting for that drug company to do a trial on a combination of isoallopregnanolone and allopregnanolone at the correct ratio, whatever that is. I'm not sure if it's 50-50. So if somebody from that company is listening, then um, give it a try and shout us out <laughs> for the well, idea. The, the documents have actually revealed that that combination product comes out 10 years later after the patents on the originals expire. 
as is custom. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you wouldn't want to have a product come out where your patents would stack because then your company wouldn't make enough money to fund future research for future um, yachts and trips to the Caribbean. Bingo. <laughs> Uh, teasing aside, we do poke fun at the, the pharmaceutical industry, just as we do the traditional you know, medical treatment guidelines and, and people that work in those organizations. But um, we do like to keep our nice guy reputations intact, but we also like to have fun. Yeah. All right. So then they have, you know, we talked about, this looks like a repeat of the same. Yeah, we talked about the synthetic progestin. We did. The yep. Um, and then here's with no evidence, mixed evidence, or negative evidence. Hmm. Lifestyle changes. It seems like a good idea. We like to say lifestyle changes are more powerful than any pill or supplement. Yeah, so I think um, I mentioned earlier alcohol. Like that's going to destabilize, destabilize GABA for sure. And people, you know, even men will sometimes get rebound anxiety after a night of drinking. Uh, and this is not just like, you know, waking up. You know, feeling shaky and so forth. Some mm -hmm. people will have a severe uptick in anxiety. It's like, okay, it's a pretty good sign to not do that again. Um, and then reducing caffeine, it, this certainly makes sense um, because you don't want more norepinephrine uh, circulating and in, in increasing heart rate and stimulating mm -hmm. an anxiety response. Some people have an anxiety response to caffeine at baseline. Um, and then the other thing, it actually doesn't mention stress there, but limiting stress mm. um, would be you know, a pretty good idea because mm. we know that anxiety and depression definitely have a stress-induced component to them. Yeah. Um, I'll take this opportunity to put my functional medicine tinfoil hat on and mention MSG, monosodium glutamate. Um, perhaps along with alcohol, very reasonable to avoid the last seven to 10 days of the menstrual cycle. Um, we'll talk about uh, some other things like agmatine later. But the um, glutamate excitotoxin pathway is something that um, perhaps should be thought about and um, try it. And there's very little downside to avoiding MSG and alcohol. I see how you feel. I speculate it's got a better risk benefit profile than having your uterus and ovaries removed. Yeah, I think so as well. And there's many people, that, at least anecdotally in the functional medicine community, that avoid MSG and alcohol at certain times of the cycle, and it seems to work well. Um, the devil's advocate to that would be, of course, placebo works particularly well in not only PMDD and PMS, but also in postpartum blues and postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any pathology where there's any kind of psychiatric overlap, you have a, a robust placebo response, which makes it um, even harder to develop effective agents around that. Or easier if you don't reveal yeah. the statistics in the placebo group. Yeah, and that's likely why bioidentical hormone treatments with isoallopregnanolone or allopregnanolone have uh, trouble proving efficacy is because it works extremely well, but the placebo also works 40, 50% of the study group. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other one here, uh, vitamin and mineral supplements. Um, you know, we'll talk about what we think might be beneficial here, vitamin and supplement wise, you know, things you could get over the counter. Um, I, I don't think it's a bad idea having adequate calcium, magnesium, vitamin D and B6, um, either in your diet or in a supplemental form. Uh, the calcium one is interesting because this doesn't relate to sort of the, what we've been focusing on is the progesterone and progesterone metabolism. There's an estrogen dependent flux in calcium level um, I don't know if this comes from the, the action on um, osteoclast and bone resorption, um, but it might make sense if you have a swing of estradiol from 300 at ovulation down to 50 in your follicular phase. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some fluctuation in calcium level there, and there's a few small trials that have seen, you know, somewhere around 1,000 milligrams of calcium have been beneficial in this luteal phase to kind of stabilize that. Uh, again, you know, not nearly as effective as some of these other things we talked about, but, you know, not a lot of downside to that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, talk to your doctor or nurse practitioner. You know, some people are not good candidates to take extra calcium, and you should know that. This is also a good time, this being the luteal phase, to implement the Huberman sleep stack. You sleep a bit better. You feel a bit better during the day. L-theanine is going to increase the alpha waves in the brain, almost like meditation and prayer, which is also good to do. And uh, the magnesium is going to help you be a bit more relaxed, sleep a bit better, that'd be mag glycinate or mag threonate. 
And then on top of that, I like to add in inositol. So inositol can also help with sleep. If you're depleted, then uh, it can lead to um, poor sleep. Inositol builds up in neurons. And another thing that I've added in a few patients is organic lithium, also known as lithium orotate, not a prescription. It does not have the uh, renotoxic side effects or um, a lot of the side effects. You don't want to add it in if you're actively trying to conceive still because it is lithium. And one of the side effects of lithium is that it depletes inositol in the CNS. So you stack your inositol, a touch of organic lithium, a bit of L-theanine the last 7 to 14 days of the cycle, and that can help. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that is a good summary. Uh, let's see here. Um, you know, they talk about things that are, you know, not particularly effective here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a copper IUD, uh, again, I'm not surprised by that because it is a non-hormonal contraception. Um, copper IUD plus dutasteride would be an interesting stack. It would be. Um, if you're looking at a woman who desires long-term contraception, doesn't want to alter hormone production, but wants to resolve the PMDD and perhaps suffers from a bit of acne or hair loss, that could be for a sort of niche patient, uh, a very good option. Yeah, a lot of my most functionally, naturally minded patients really like dutasteride um, when they have no desire to do any childbearing soon. Because if you think about it, it's not, uh, it's altering an enzyme and it's the ratio of the enzyme. So you can alter the dose of dutasteride depending on how uh, estrogenic you want to shift things versus how androgenic you want to shift things. It increases your testosterone. So it actually might have a slight net benefit in body composition and burning body fat, the lipolysis benefit that you can get from it. And it also slightly increases estradiol as well. So it's kind of a, another benefit in, um, uh, in some women. An that, estrogen booster. That you're suppressing estradiol of. Yeah, estrogen booster. So um, think of it as a, a fairly natural thing, just like I think of PDE5s as a fairly natural thing as well, keeping PDE5 levels to um, that naturally rise over age to a fairly normal level. It's a bit of an aside. Um, maybe that's a good um, list that we can do in the future, top five or top 10 most natural pharmaceutical medications. Yeah, to make your body function like it was 10 years ago. Ooh, that sounds like a clickbait title in the making. Yeah. Uh, Danazole, this one was kind of surprising to me because it has so many different actions and targets. It's an androgen, it's yep. an estrogen, it's a progestogen. Uh, I believe it even has some activity on mineral corticoid receptors. Um, but it was, you know, uh, not effective. It says uh, it has not been tested. Um and again, it does carry a risk of uh, VTE. There's probably better agents to be used there. Yeah, I think this is what people used to call danazol, manazol. So not really used anymore. Yeah, the risk of virilization for sure. Um, benzodiazepines, not recommended. Um, interestingly, I, I think there was a mouse paper I was looking at. Uh, allopregnanolone is uh, even more potent at, you know, increasing GABA signaling than a benzodiazepine. I don't remember the specific one they were looking at, um, but it was something like a tenfold difference. And it's not a direct agonist, it's a modulator of GABA signaling. So I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, benzodiazepines sound like another good way to destabilize your GABA signaling during this time, um, especially if you have a particularly short acting one. Mm. The last one is bioidentical progesterone or progestogens only without estrogens. This is kind of interesting, um, but they said uh, basically no evidence or negative evidence. So you could make the case that, um, you know, it's, it's proven that if you take bioidentical progesterone orally, it goes through first pass in the liver. You have a pretty high amount of conversion to progestogenic neurosteroids. So you could use this in concert with other things, um, by itself, it doesn't have great evidence, but there's a decent amount of patients that are on something serotonergic plus bioidentical progesterone, and they do quite well. Yeah, or something to modulate cortisol because you can't always avoid the stress in your life. So there are you know, adaptogens out there that you can use to sort of push back against that stress uh, to some degree. It's not 100% effective, but like everything else, it's a tool. Um, so there's a lot of options. So looking at this, it's not like you have A or B or C or D all the way on. 
um, you can a lot of times use a little bit of a couple different things and get a much mm -hmm. better side effect profile, much better benefit profile. So we talked about no testosterone in the stable hormone add back. Mm -hmm. um, recapping the dutasteride study, it was actually the same authors. You, know, you mentioned the study with the 0 0.5 milligram dutasteride. Mm -hmm. um, very smart of them to try a, like, suppose a mega dose, you could call it. Yeah. Um, because if they had just done the study on 0 0.5 and said, hey, this doesn't work, then we wouldn't know about it as a treatment option. Um, but they did measure allopregnanolone. I believe it was serum, and I imagine there's some good correlation mm -hmm. given the abundance of data there. Yep. Uh, between brain levels and blood levels. Um, and they saw that that didn't change uh, with the 0 0.5 milligram dose. So this is reassuring for those worried about uh, post dutasteride syndrome, Yep, that you could, in theory, take 0 0.5 milligrams every day and you're not going to alter your allopregnanolone because um, mm -hmm. you know, even in males, there is some conversion of progesterone uh, production and then conversion to allopregnanolone. Even head to head with finasteride, it appears that dutasteride has a lot less inhibition of allopregnanolone level. Yeah, and it could even be coming from the pregnenolone, mm -hmm. um, which is another thing that uh, women could potentially use. Um, another study we'll talk about used a cyclical um, progesterone, bioidentical, um, twice per day. A lot of women would not be able to tolerate that. Progesterone yep. tends to make you sleepy. Um, you can actually increase allopregnanolone by using pregnenolone, um, which some people find to be a bit stimulating. Uh, most people don't find it to be sedating or certainly not as sedating as progesterone. Mm -hmm. So a better option like you outlined there was maybe a bit of pregnenolone in the morning and then progesterone taken in the evening or before bed so that you're sleeping a little bit better. Yeah, and we do this often. Progesterone and pregnenolone do have quite fast half-lives. But even if progesterone is a half-life of five to six hours, the trickle-down effect or the progestogen cascade where you have progesterone converting to its neurosteroids, then those have their own half-life. So it's not like you have um, zero pharmacodynamic effect um, seven hours after you're ta taking your capsule of oral progesterone. But in most cases, it's best to just keep the progesterone to taking it in the evening before bed, and then you fill with pregnenolone in uh, the rest throughout the day. I have not seen any studies on this. Um, hopefully people will, will use that combination, but I guess pregnenolone is an over-the-counter supplement and not a medication, so drug companies don't have a lot of incentive to do that. Um, at some point, we would love to run the studies because we see our patients on regimens like this and they do quite well. Yeah, and then we have low doses of fluoxetine. Uh, and this is actually a double-blind placebo-controlled pilot study. Um, and it found that even at you know, what you would consider sub-therapeutic doses of fluoxetine or Prozac, mm -hmm. uh, that there was improvement in the symptoms of you know, PMDD. And this was, uh, they, actually in this one, they did as low as two milligrams. For yeah. That. Two milligrams, it didn't seem to do anything, wasn't statistically significant. I would suspect that for someone who happened to be a slow metabolizer of fluoxetine, um, which there are tests you can do to you know, look at that specific enzyme, um, but probably not necessary. You can always start with a lower dose, go up to get a two milligram dose. You'd probably have to use a liquid product. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't even know if they make a five milligram tablet or capsule. That's a pretty low dose. Yeah, it's a, it's a very low dose. Um, which again, uh, prompts the question, what was the mechanism of action given that SSRIs have multiple pharmacodynamic effects? In fact, even for its general indications like general anxiety disorder or depression, we don't know if it's truly the increase in serotonin at the synaptic cleft, synaptic cleft that is um, causing the therapeutic effect. It's probably at least part of it, or it's yeah. uh, like downstream genomic effects. Yeah, or which of the, what there's, how many serotonin receptors, 17 unique ones or something that have been identified. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no way that we have the data about all these drugs and all those receptors. So. Uh, by far and large, we know some of the mechanisms, but a lot of the mechanisms are still unknown. Mm -hmm. And then we have this really interesting trial. Um, I left out their days and their sort of methods because it was annoying to me that they altered day one of the menstrual cycle to be the LH surge um, as day one of their treatment protocol, rather than just moving things um, in a more organized fashion. But we still kind of get the idea here when we mm -hmm. put these pictures up, you can see that 
Uh, basically, your LH surge is on the far left. That's where you have your spike in estradiol. And then you see the progesterone roller coaster. And this is the placebo condition, right? So it looks like a very normal menstrual cycle pattern. Yep. Then we go to the active condition where they introduced a uh, transdermal estradiol patch, uh, 0.1 milligram. And then they introduced oral micronized progesterone, 100 milligrams twice per day. And I, I don't think this is an actual like, draw of the, the blood levels because you're not going to see the progesterone levels on blood work if you took them the night before. Mm -hmm. But this is sort of a simulation of, okay, now that roller coaster is leveled out. It's very smooth. Um, and indeed, this did improve symptoms. This was a particularly um, ill population. They were, um, I think, identified from psychiatric facilities and then basically mm -hmm. was looking at their suicidal ideation because that does tend to peak in this luteal phase for women, especially women with comorbid depression. Mm -hmm. Sort of a perfect storm, if you will. And the good news is um, it reduced suicidal ideation during the treatment period. Uh, the bad news is suicidal ideation peaked after they withdrew those hormones because you get that same sort of destabilization. So we were looking at this and talking about this and um, there's some things they could have done differently. Mm -hmm. it, it's like they pulled them out a bit early. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's kind of not surprising that they got that same withdrawal effect. Yeah, they could have added the estrogen a bit later. They also used a relatively high dose of estradiol, um, quite high for a replacement dose. Mm -hmm. um, so they could have used a lower dose, started it a bit later so that the um, estradiol peak would have um, been... Uh, graduated, if you will, just less in general, less peak, less of a trough when you withdraw. And they could have also altered how they um, replace the progesterone. Yeah, uh, perhaps with our you know, pregnant alone in the morning, progesterone in the evening protocol. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm looking at this, uh, I'm, I'm not a statistician, we haven't run the numbers on it, but it looks like there's a much smaller area under the curve and a lower peak in both suicide planning and suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a lower net negative impact than the placebo group. So uh, this is something that you know has published data that could potentially be used and it's bioidentical. Yep. I probably wouldn't use that high of a dose of estradiol. Um, it's questionable as to whether you even need that estradiol. Uh, much more focuses around the progesterone and then the downstream gabinergic component of that. Yeah, perhaps they used estradiol just because at least the guidelines today tend to say combined estrogen and progestogen replacement has better evidence than progestogen only. So now people are hesitant to study progestogen only. Yeah. Um, and we talked about agmatine earlier, and some people probably thought we lost our marbles, but... <laughs> What do we know about agmatine and PMDD, uh, specifically in a rat model? Yeah, um, in progesterone withdrawn female rats, which is a rat model for um, luteal phase or PMDD rats, um, the, it enhanced the marble bearing anxiety. I'm not exactly sure how they measured this or how much carry over it has to human data, but it's certainly very interesting. Also immobility time this was attenuated significantly by agmatine, which does have effects on uh, glutamate and NMDA receptor activation. I believe it's specifically an NMDA receptor antagonist. antagonist. I know that there's a very rare autoimmune condition, um, which is uh, you form an autoantibody to the NMDA receptor, and um, it can cause psychosis and hallucinations, etc. cetera. Um, so this is um, glutamate is tied into NMDA activity. Um, that's why we mentioned monosodium glutamate and um, agmatine can help attenuate this as a sort of an antipsychotic, but without being a direct dopamine receptor antagonist. Yeah. And this is something that is actually in, uh, you know, a number of pre-workouts. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a number of women who started working out and using a pre-workout mm -hmm. and then noticed that, hey, you know, the exercise helped my PMDD, which it certainly should. Uh, but also maybe the agmatine is sort of an added bonus there that's also helping to stabilize things. Um, as far as the safety profile, because that's what we always have to ask ourselves when we're looking at it, any kind of treatment. Um, it's been studied for three weeks uh, at fairly high doses, I believe in the two to four gram per day range, which is a very high dose, yeah. uh, in like neuropathic pain and in conditions that are similarly related. 
Um, and then there was a self-published study that was really interesting. Uh, individual, they had been taking it for five years at a dose, I think between two and three grams per day. Um, no abnormal you know, physical exam findings, blood chemistry findings, et cetera, et cetera, with their primary care. Um, again, not a whole lot of measurement being done there, but you know, it seems to speak to at least being something that would be safe to be used. And you could probably use it cyclically as well. You don't necessarily mm-hmm. need it you know, 31 days out of the month. Yeah, um, definitely another good adjunct option. Um, the and next... Uh, go, ahead, go ahead and read this one. I have some commentary I'd like to add. The next title is What's Stopping Us Using GnRH Analogs with Stable Hormone ADBAC in Treatment Resistance, PMDD, Practical Guidelines, and Risk-Benefit Analysis for Long-Term Therapy. Oh, so this is probably a throwback to like a 1960s or 1970s paper, right? When was this published? 2023. Oh, although this must just be a bunch of male doctors that want to castrate women. No, it does not appear to be the case. Published um, by a, a Melissa, Alyssa, a Jacqueline, and an Ashley. Uh, Jordan and Tori are gender neutral, so presumably these could be female or male, be. but definitely a majority female publication. Yeah, not that it matters, but it's just the title is so uh, almost outlandishly clickbaity, if you will, especially for a scientific study. That you'd have to wonder about the motive of the study of these authors. Uh, are they affiliated with companies that um, promote or sell GnRH analogs? Yeah, uh, let's fix it. Uh, what's stopping us? Castration plus HRT. There. Now people will understand what that actually means. Yeah, uh, that is very apt. So um, presumably they do discuss some of the risks of this. Um, but uh, yeah, th- there's, there's quite a few risks. Fertility is one of the main ones. And um, being on uh, possibly a lifetime of HRT is the next yeah, one. I think uh, starting menopause at age 25 instead of age 50. Yeah, the, the other thing that I think about this is why do we have to chemically castrate these women? Why can't we just use bioidentical HRT? It's well studied and a lot of people are familiar with doing it in women that are premenopausal. And it has good evidence as well. And its um, risk profile is much better. Yeah, and in some of these cases, they do bioidentical ADBAC, which is really counterintuitive to the bulk of the mainstream literature, um, but certainly makes sense in the, you know, we do it in premenopause and all of a sudden you get to postmenopause and that stuff is too dangerous or too complicated. It's, it's a really mm-hmm. weird dichotomy. So you have your naturally or functionally minded individual or your individual that doesn't want to um, be uh, too aggressive with pharmacology and they say, hey, uh, for my PMDD or my PMS, can I have some bioidentical hormones? And the uh, physician says, well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is yes, you can. The bad news is we have to chemically castrate you in order to give you that. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it at least be reasonable to give someone a trial of some cyclical progesterone, yeah. plus or minus estradiol? You don't even have to add that one in necessarily yeah. before you uh, have them injecting Lupron. It, it just, to yeah. me, it seems like quite a jump, a big step towards a more aggressive medical intervention. I guess to play devil's advocate, they did say treatment resistant, but treatment resistant could just mean they tried an SSRI and cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, oral contraceptive, and they didn't feel great on an oral contraceptive. Surprise, surprise. Um, see our oral, oral contraceptive episode um, for um, new psychiatric admissions and diagnoses related to that. Um, and also no surprise if they didn't feel great on an SSRI. Also no surprise if they didn't feel great after therapy. Yeah, I mean, well, if we were to design the worst possible stack, um, you know, maybe they went on an SSRI. Well, let's say they went on citalopram cyclically, so they get some nice withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. Um, they go on, uh, let's say, levonorgestrel as their contraceptive because that's the one that's associated with uh, the most depression. Didn't they have a psychiatric hospital admission? 
You're Ooh, starting on that's, the answer. That's a wrinkle in the case. I wasn't even going to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> the odds ratio for that is, I, I think it's something like 1.7. It's, it's fairly high. Anyway, um, continuing on the case, there would so anyway, be an SSRI regardless. Yeah, so that SSRI didn't work. First line, okay, SSRIs don't work for you. Second line, well, oral contraceptives don't work for you. Guess it's time for either surgery or GnRH shots. Yeah, that's a, that's a rough choice. I might choose Seroquel <laughs> if those <laughs> are the other options. Um, yeah, um, I think that's a pretty good summary. In the future, as we noted, we will discuss um, a lot more about 5-alpha reductase, about 3-alpha uh, hydroxyl steroid dehydrogenase. Um, we'll discuss more about the progestogen pool, the androgen pool. And keep in mind that when you're um, affecting one hormone, you're going to have a downstream effect from other ones. So with uh, most of these treatments where you're altering estrogen and progestogenic signaling, androgenic signaling will also be influenced. And I don't think uh, in the this non-systematic review of the clinical literature, I don't think I saw that mentioned one time. Yeah, I don't think so. The focus was, again, very minimally on estradiol, zero on testosterone or, or androgens other than the fact that dutasteride is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And the bulk of the focus being on progesterone, progestogens, and this GABA-A receptor. So uh, stay tuned for our Your Brain on Steroids, or Neurosteroid podcast, come mm -hmm. out soon. I'm excited to film that one. Uh, and thank you for your time uh, and listening. Hopefully you found some information here that you didn't know about previously. Let us know the, the best and the worst things you've tried for PMDD, if you're an individual who has mm -hmm. struggled with this. And may God bless you with health and happiness. Thank you. Thank you.